Yo, what's up YouTube? This is your boy Alex. Today is officially Wednesday and I have a new exciting video for y'all. This one was well planned, well thawed out. I took some time to collect the names together. And this one's going to be quite of an interesting video. This one's going to be called um, Sex Game, the Best Black Men and Women in History for Women and for Men. That's African-American men and women because it's February, right? And I make a lot of YouTube videos. And a lot of black men and black women have seen a lot of my YouTube videos. And the first thing they're going to start wondering is why you ain't made no video about African-American history. And it's February. I got neighbors across the street that watch my videos. I got people at local stores that watch my videos. And they see me every day. And they know I do YouTube videos. And the first thing they're going to look at me is, it's February. You need to make a video about African American History Month. You black. Everything else comes second. You know, you can talk about television and film later. You can, have talk, you can talk about women later. Right now, it's African American History Month. So what are you waiting for? All right. So I got 11 names, 11 spots. Um, you do know that if I try to add more spots to the video the bigger the video get the longer it takes to upload you know and people don't want to watch videos that are like uh 45 minutes long because people got bigger and better things to, to do like wash their clothes pay their bills do their tax returns and the last thing they want is to see a video that's 45 minutes too long so uh i got 11 spots 11 names I apologize if your favorite African-American man or woman and their greatest accomplishment is not mentioned in this video. If this video gets well received, then I will put it on two channels. So you will get a chance to watch this video on my premiere channel. So it ain't going to be just on one channel. It's going to be on two channels. You can watch it today, tomorrow, three days later, next week. The whole entire month of February is basically African-American History Month. So you have a whole lot of time to watch this video. All right, coming in at number 11 is Issa Rae. Now, she is a famous black woman who's been in Hollywood for the past 13, 14 years. Now, she did stand-up comedy, you know, then she became a executive producer and a writer, and she became an actress, and then she did this one movie on YouTube, and that blew up, and that got her a lot of attraction in these, you know, small parts in movies and television shows, um, I discovered her in commercials and then in small parts and roles of movies, you know, romantic comedy movies. And then she hit it really big with HBO called Insecure, which ran for four seasons. I wouldn't be surprised if she came back and made a, a, a revised version and say, you know, let's make a season five or six or possibly down the road a movie or a spinoff with other characters. Now, her creativity is pretty good. You know, if she can write, she can produce, and she can act, I give it another two, maybe three, maybe four more years down the road, if not now. She pretty soon will be directing. Because if you're already writing and you're already producing, you're already acting, directing is up your alley. And she's a very talented black woman. Now, you know, she's kind of underrated because a lot of people don't give too much black women in Hollywood enough respect and credit that they rightfully deserve. I mean, because she, she, she's a talented actress. Like, when she has her moments when she does shine in movies and television. Like, she may not be like any of the actresses we know, but, you know, you give her enough time. Um, she can shine, you know, you give her some big name actors and she can hold her own with some big name actors. You know, I've seen some of her movies. Um, they're not that bad, you know. I mean, she's a good producer, a good writer. You know, her acting's okay. I mean, give her enough time. She'll surprise you. She'll shock you. You know, she did that one romantic comedy movie where that guy um, was going to leave New York and go to, you know, London. I don't want to spoil the movie if you ain't never seen it. It was done last year. And it was a good romantic comedy. I mean, it wasn't that bad. It was very well good and very good well received. It was a good take on a black um, couple. So it was betrayed in a good light. So she did, you know, it got people's attention. People watched it. People supported her. She looked good in the movie. So that says something about her creativity as a, an actress, a producer, um, and as a writer. But I do guarantee you pretty soon in two, three more years, she'll probably start directing. 
you know, because that usually comes next. Um, coming in at number 10 is Regina King. Now, she is a triple threat, and she's been around for like three to four decades. Now, we've seen her in a whole lot of movies. We saw her in Friday, I'm thinking. Um, or that could have been, um, what's her name? But she did audition for Friday if she wasn't in it, but she was in Boys in the Hood with Ice Cube. So that's kind of why I said Friday, Boys in the Hood. Um, and she was in some romantic comedies, and she was in those two movies with um, Sandra Bullock in it. So she's been in some share of movies. Um, and now she's a director now. Now she produces, she writes, she directs, and she acts. And she just did a movie about Muhammad Ali not just long, long too long ago, One Night in Miami. Please don't ruin the movie for me. I have not seen it. It seems like it's very well received. And she's good at finding actors and actresses to play these characters. So that shows her creativity right off the bat. She's pretty good at making a movie and she's good at creating the set. Like, it didn't take a lot of money in the budget for her to do this. So she's very well good at putting this whole produ production together. So I look forward to seeing more of her directing. You know, I've seen her in television and film. And when she did her commercial, she directed a commercial. So you're seeing her display her full range. You know, if anybody else... Um, deserves an Oscar besides Angela Bassett, you, you could look at Regina King. There's a reason why her last name's King, because she's a triple threat. You know, I'm pretty sure she gonna do some more movies. I wouldn't be surprised if Marvel come knocking at the door and say, hey, we need you to come in and help out with the production of, you know, movies. So we'll see. She has a bright future in directing. You know, so she reinvents herself. That's what's good about her. She don't just go, well, the far as I can go is act. She go, no, I'm I'm, I'm a direct. You know, I'm gonna do some commercials. I wouldn't be surprised if she did some music videos. You you may never know what she might do next. Um, so coming in at number nine is Eva Devlovere. Sorry if I butchered the last name. By this point, y'all should know who this is. She's one of the few brightest African-American black women in Hollywood who is produce, write, and direct feature-length films. Um, that movie um, with, um, what's her name, that caused a lot of backlash three years ago. I think A Wrinkle in Time. It had um, Oprah Winfrey in it and... Um, What's that actress? The one everybody gets mad at, but she and I'm not trying to take anybody's side, but she kind of was on to something when she said that movie wasn't for um, for a certain demographics and everybody just lost their mind when she said it. You know who I'm talking about, but she directed that film and she did a movie called Sama, which we all know was actually about Luther Martin King Jr. Um, so she's pretty good at directing feature length films. Now, it's unfortunate she didn't get a chance to direct Black Panther or Captain Marvel, but I do believe in the future she will get a chance to do a Marvel or DC film. And this black woman has opened the doors for black women of her generation to come in and do feature-length films. So you, you can't mention a black woman's accomplishments without mentioning her. You know, I can't wait to see what other feature length films should come. I've seen small parts of the movie Sama. Very well produced, written, directed. Um, she's another one that's good at making sets. And she's good at bringing the best out in all the actors and actresses that play those characters. Um, she's good. You know, I'm amazed that she's gotten high on the list. Whenever they think of the best directors in Hollywood, they think of her as one of the top female directors. You know, her, Patty Jenkins, but she's on that level. She's on the same level as Patty Jenkins. You know, she can get phone calls from Michelle and Barack Obama because she's on that level. She can get phone calls from Oprah Winfrey. Most people um, can go 10, 15, 20 years, but this woman is on that level where she can get phone calls from the former president former president like Oprah Winfrey you know when you can get phone calls from those people you know you've done something you made a big contribution in the African-American community coming in at number eight is my man Tyler Perry Tyler Perry in my opinion is kind of like 
the man who is killing it right now. I mean, and you know what I mean. This guy is like no movie or no script goes past anyone unless it's going to Tyler Perry. This guy takes concepts that nobody thinks about and makes them into movies and television shows. And for him to do that in a short period of 12 to 13 years is astonishing because it takes the average career 20, 25 years to do it. He did it in less than 12 to 13 years. And this guy can get phone calls from Michelle Obama, Barack Obama. This guy can get phone calls from Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Oprah Winfrey. This guy can get phone calls from Stephen A. Smith because he's big time like that. This guy took church plays from almost 20 years ago and almost all those plays that he done are movies, television shows, plays. He's taken African-American actors and actresses from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, people's my age, and gave them a big boost in their career. Most people's career um, after 12, 15 years is over. He has the ability to take someone who's been acting and revive their acting career and give them roles in movies and television shows where they weren't getting it in the first place. And I actually had the privilege to see a Tyler Perry play like a long time ago. I'll go maybe four or five years back. I was working at this church and the church that I was working at, the people that worked at the church actually discovered Tyler Perry in the beginning of his career. You know, those stories about him sleeping in his car, you know, he didn't have no job. He had no place to go to. And these people took him in and he would write plays for almost three to four hours Every day would write plays. That's that's how I heard the story. He would just write plays constantly. And they said all those plays that he wrote, you're seeing them being made in the movies and television shows. So to me, he's the man. Like, if you're going to see the passing of the torch, like from Samuel Jackson or Denzel Washington to Tyler Perry, that's who you would expect to pass the torch to. It would probably be Tyler Perry. Like, Tyler Perry is the man. You know, he write, he produce, he direct, he acts. He do movies, television plays. There's 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 nothing that he don't do that he does do. And the guy is proud to be a black man because he doing it in a place that people told him it was impossible to do. He doing it in Atlanta. Right on location, be making movies in Atlanta. You know, so that's a good guy to have in your corner. All right, coming in at number seven is Kobe Bryant. One of the greatest professional basketball talents of all times. Five NBA championships, seven NBA finals, inducted into the National Basketball Hall of Fame, High School Hall of Fame, International Basketball Hall of Fame. This man will always go down in history as the best basketball player to play the game. Now, it was unfortunate on what happened last year. You know, that was like a tough year for all of us, you know. And the fact that we have so many memories of Kobe Bryant from when we were in high school to college to our young adult life. We have so many memories of Kobe Bryant. One of my most memorable, most favorite moments of Kobe Bryant on the basketball court is the 2006 2007 NBA season. They lost seven games in a row, and he didn't want to lose eight in a row, and they were going against the Toronto Raptors, and it looked like for almost two quarters that Toronto was putting a, a beating on the Lakers for 30 points, and all of a sudden, Kobe had this, this warrior mentality look on his face, this black mamba. I refuse to lose. All of a sudden, Kobe scores 20 points, 25 points, 30, 40. All right, he's just scoring his usual 40 points. That ain't no big deal. 45, 50. Okay, Kobe getting on fire. 55 points. Oh, snap. Those are Will Chamberlain numbers. Drop 60, 65. I'm like, oh, man. Next thing you know, the score cut down to 10 points. And I'm looking at Toronto like, y'all got to be concerned about this. You know, and all of a sudden, 70, 72 points. 75 points. All of a sudden, 81. Next thing you know, Lakers win the game, and they win the next seven games after he scored 81 points. And then we fast forward to his retirement game, and it seemed like he was going to do it again in his retirement game. The man dropped 60 points in his retirement game. 
and people have always threw up that um, billion dollar question um, which one was always better Kobe's 81 point performance or Kobe's 60 perform um, six point performance I always say they're on the same level because he gave the same effort the same intensity the same motivation if anybody got to the closest of playing like Michael Jordan it was always Kobe Bryant because Kobe would put up those same numbers Michael would put up Kobe would have that same warrior mentality instinct like Michael would do Kobe would always play four quarters and Kobe would be like we'll go to a game five we'll go to a game six but I ain't going to no game seven but when Kobe did go to game seven he still would win the game sevens where Michael would never go to a game seven Kobe would win game sevens if he went to one so even if you push Kobe to that extra mile Kobe wasn't giving you 70, 80, 90, or 100%. Kobe was like giving you 110. And then dig extra deep and do what you think is impossible, give you 120%. So that is one of my most memorable games of Kobe Bryant. There is another one. There's another one where he um, was playing against Portland in the 2000 and one 2002 NBA season and he scored 32 points and he uh stole the ball from one of their um I think from um I, I forgot his name but he's an NBA commentator now used to play with Portland used to play with the Spurs um but he stole the ball from him and went for this alley oop dunk that gave the Lakers the victory over Portland so I have some memories of the great Kobe Bryant um, Kobe and his daughter will be greatly missed. Um, we have to have him on here because he is one of the greatest African Americans that kind of opened the door for you to play basketball, be multi talented, speak multiple languages. And the fact that Kobe would do his own feature length film and got an Oscar for it is worth mentioning. Coming in at number six is Whoopi Goldberg, the most funniest black woman I have ever heard in my entire life. There are plenty of African-American comedians that are funny. Whoopi Goldberg is the funniest. She don't tell stories that make you laugh. She tells stories that people would say, that's not funny, and find some comical way to get you to laugh at something that's not really funny. Like, talk about how her life story was, how it took her years to get to Hollywood, how she started off as a radio personality, then television and film. And a lot of the stuff you see in the movies just happen to be, you get to see blends of the real Whippy Goldberg. Like, she's serious. She's someone that you really want to get great advice from. She's funny. Like, besides Big Boy in the Morning on the radio pulling pranks, she's like the queen of pulling pranks. Like, she opened doors for black women to do comedy because at that time, they didn't really allow too many people to do comedy like Whippy. And Whippy kind of broke all these barriers in that, in that time when they didn't think someone of her stature could do it. And then to do a movie called Polar, Color Purple, it, it stands to the test of time. It's like five decades later and people are still looking at that movie. Coming in at number six is my man Denzel Washington. My man. Denzel is like the Michael Jordan of this. Why? Because you don't mention the best African Americans without mentioning Denzel Washington. The man's been doing movies for three plus decades, probably four. The guy's got so many movies, it's hard to name all of them. There's all my personal favorites, um, American Gangster, um, Training Day, John Cube, um... The Equalizer, Equalizer Part 2, um, The Devil in the Blue Dress, Velocity, um, The Preacher's Wife. There's a lot of Denzel Washington movies. Remember the Titans? It's a whole bunch of Denzel Washington films. You know, there are even movies that um, people don't remember. Ricochet, when he was with Ice-T. You know, there's a lot of Denzel classic movies. A lot of Denzel classic movies. Um... But Denzel is the man because he's wrote, he's produced, he's directed, and he's acted in his own movies. Even when he did that one movie with Gene Hackman, is the movie The Stuff of Legend. Then he did a movie with Derek Luke. Um, Denzel is the man. When when you when you think of Denzel Washington, you think of him as the Renaissance man. Because if it weren't for Denzel Washington, there probably would have never been any Wesley Snipes. There probably would have not been no Dwayne The Rock Johnson. There probably would have not been no um, um, 
Will Smith, no Martin Lawrence, Eddie Murphy, a lot of these guys would have not came if it weren't for Denzel Washington. Like, Eddie Murphy was already there, but what I mean is, if it weren't for Denzel, you would not have this era of black action heroes. Because, you know, Denzel kind of came in there and did that whole action hero thing, and then, you, you know, Will Smith came, you know, then Eddie Murphy, then Martin Lawrence, you know, Wesley Snipes, one of my all-time favorites, then Samuel Jackson got into the craze, you know, there was Sidney Poitier, because, you know, Sidney Poitier really came first. But he never got the respect and the credit that he deserved. And Denzel Washington learned from Azenti Potier because Azenti Potier was Denzel's hero. And then, you know, you look at Denzel, I look at Denzel as a hero. But when you say the renaissance of it, you could say in the beginning it's Azenti Potier, Denzel. And then you can kind of say right towards the middle, you could say it's Wesley Snipes, um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Will Smith, Eddie Murphy. You know, you can say all of them came and they're what we see today. You know, then Michael B. Jordan, that's how it would say the transitional period. Now you can say it's Michael B. Jordan. I'm talking about as far as black action hero. So you, you would probably say Denzel Washington is the man regarding that. Coming in at number four is Oprah Winfrey. Well, you can't do a list without Oprah Winfrey. This woman, we all know her story. She had to drive two to three buses to get to school every day. And to travel from one state to another state just to go to that school. And then to graduate from college. And then to do television broadcasting, news journalists, news anchoring. To having her own television show for 20 plus years. To getting cable networks. To writing books. To being one of the most richest black women in the world. And to me, she opened doors. She didn't just open doors. She opened doors for both african-american men and women so now you you can't just say she just opened doors she opened doors for both and when you do both that's that's big significance that's big time big impact accomplishment this woman can go to breakfast lunch and dinner with michelle obama barack obama she can chill out with magic johnson she can hang out with michael jordan tiger woods you know, she can, you know, call Stephen A. Smith on speed dial. What you doing, Stephen A. Smith? Oh, nothing, Oprah. I'm just here at ESPN, you know, looking at these haters that be hating on me. You know, she can do all of that. She can, if she wanted to, she could get on the phone and surprise someone because that's Oprah Winfrey. You know, this woman can come on television and sit there with, um... Her best friend Gail and Walter Walpers, Walters and anyone else in the realm of television. Like, she got it like that. Like, she could, you know, hang out with Brian Gumbel of sports if she wanted to. She could sit there with Serena Williams and Venus Williams and take pictures all day. Because she on that level. She big time like that. And she's opened doors for African American men and women um, for years and years and years to come. In Africa and school. So, that, that's telling you something right there. Look Look how far she went. Look how many grounds she broke in. Coming in at number three is Michael Jordan, another great professional basketball talent. Now, Michael Jordan is the man when it comes to basketball. This guy's got his own shoes, clothing line, hot dog, yes, ballparks. I mean, come on now. Ballparks, Michael Jordan tennis shoes, clothing line, Michael Jordan cologne. The guy has been synonymous with basketball six-time nba champion six championships two three-peats undefeated in the finals they never lost in the finals they never went to a game seven the guy has beaten everyone that he's ever faced on the basketball court now he's a multi-billionaire successful billionaire black billionaire and the fact that he could be having his own basketball team now he has his own nascar team and the fact that he's even bigger than he was when he played basketball. And then the fact that every now and then he will give out scholarship money to kids in high school and college. Every now and then he will come out and give out a motor, motivational speech. Every now and then he would write a book, do a movie, have a documentary get done about him. You know, you look at The Last Dance, that was by far one of the best Michael Jordan documentaries to a lot of people. I've seen it. 
And I grew up in the era of Michael Jordan. Before LeBron James, before Kobe Bryant, there was Michael Jordan. I had the privilege to see how all three basketball players play. And people have always asked me to, to, to try to explain the comparisons between Michael and Kobe. They're on the same level. Now, as far as people say, why don't you bring in LeBron, that's, that's a different discussion. That's a different story. But... If it weren't for Michael Jordan, you you would have never had no Vince Carters, no Tracy McGrady's, no Kobe Bryant's, no LeBron James. Um, none of those characters, no Kevin Durant's, no Kyrie Irvin's. None of those players would have whatever came if it, if it weren't for Michael Jordan. The, the, the way he played, the way he defied basketball, the way he changed the NBA, the way he brought the NBA culture from here to other countries. People in other countries would pick up a basketball and some pair of Jordans cut their hair off, put an earring in, and then decided, I want to be like Mike. You know, so it's, it's solidified. You know, Space Jam. Everyone watches the movie. Everyone sees the story. If it weren't for Michael Jordan. And, and the fact that he played with such tenacity for the game of basketball, you, you don't know anybody that would do what he did. Like, one of my most memorable games is the 1996-1997 NBA season where there's that famous story. He ate some pizza, and he was dehydrated, and he dropped 38 points on the Utah Jazz. Now, here I'm thinking, how is the Bulls going to beat the Jazz if the best player on the team is, is not there? And the answer was, I'm playing. I ain't no punk. And he came out with that warrior mentality and went out there and dropped 38 points and won the championship. And to have a rematch against the Jazz a year later and beat him again for his sixth and final NBA championship. And for this man to be able to sit at a table with other athletes from other sports is, you know, synonymous. All right, coming in at number two is Muhammad Ali. One of the greatest professional boxers and the king of trash talking. You know, we always give the respect to people like Roy Jones Jr., Bernard Hawkins, Sugar, um, Sugar Shane Mosley, you know, Floyd Money Mayweather Jr. They're all great boxing trash talkers. Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, Lennox Lewis. But the one who was the king of trash talking in professional boxing is Muhammad Ali. I'm 22 years old, I ain't got a mark on my face, I must be the greatest. I just upset Sonny Liston, I must be the greatest. Oh, young man rumble, oh, I must be the greatest. I'm the baddest, man. You know, three-time world heavyweight champion, won a USA gold medal, came in an era where they didn't want us to shine, to succeed. And this man transcended sports. He didn't just transcend boxing. Muhammad Ali transcended sports in general. My dad had the privilege to meet Muhammad Ali, not once, but twice. I wasn't even born. Like, if you go into a time machine and you go, like, back to 35, 40 years ago, I wasn't even born yet. But my dad met Muhammad Ali twice. My dad's seen a lot of his boxing fights. And to me, Muhammad Ali, to me, is, like, bigger than just boxing, bigger than just trash talking. Like, he's a prime example that you could come from nowhere and then come into everything, and then someone takes it away from you, and then you have to summon up the strength to get it all back. That's what Muhammad Ali is a representation of. Um, so we got Muhammad Ali. Coming in at number one is a man who to this very day is the standard of success in and off the baseball field. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. For years, we had our own baseball league, and they didn't like that. And then finally, we got into the actual baseball league, and he broke the color barrier. You know, finally, we got into baseball. You know, almost 200 years, they would not let us African Americans play baseball. Finally, he broke the color barrier. And the fact that it happened, you just like you you knew eventually we would be in basketball, football, boxing, eventually we would get in every sport. But it started with baseball. And the fact that he was the only guy at that time that could take that kind of pressure, you know, to ignore name calling. Like people like me and you, we we, we wouldn't be able to handle that pressure. You know, we would have been got in trouble. Him, he he would be called that 
15, 60, 70, 100 times in one day be called names and he would still play with 110 percent execution, you know, and they couldn't believe that they would do that and he would succeed every time um, they would do that to him. You know, every now and then it would the pressure would get to him, but he would win baseball games, get him into the World Series, you know, and get into the Hall of Fame. And he still stands as a prime example that sometimes against odds, even when there's an opportunity, you must stay firm and deliver your best performance, even when your best performance to a lot of people um, is not what they're expecting. So these are my picks. I apologize that the video is 30 minutes. Normally my videos are usually between 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes maximum, but this is 30 minutes. I apologize. Um, until next time, peace.